welcome to the art of being human. Now we're dealing with suicide. We've been doing that for the last two or three segments and I'm gonna continue with it today. And we have a while to go with it before I switch to something else. And when I do switch to something else, it'll be drug abuse because things are more complicated for suicide than they used to be. You know, I've used to, uh, I'm used to giving suicide seminars. I'm considered somewhat of a specialist in it. I've done it for quite a number of years. I've saved quite a few people from killing themselves, which I'm very grateful for, and it's gone well, but things are more complicated than they used to be. It used to be more straightforward. These are the reasons people commit suicide, this is how you prevent it, and this is what you do in emergency situations and crisis counseling and all of that. But what we have now added that's different is a lot of drug use contributing to suicide. And the problem with the drug use is that all of these drugs, some of them are new drugs that they have been uh, uh, performed, they have been made in uh, synthesizers and so forth. They, they are synthetic drugs and they're made in laboratories. And as a result of that, they're not the same. I mean, I used to be able to say the opioids do this and that, and then you have of heroin and then you have uh, all of the other kinds of drugs that we've always heard about but now the drugs are much more manufactured much more technical uh, and they're much more dangerous now all drugs are dangerous and I'm not making light of that at all but now the drugs are such that they come out of laboratories and then people put things in them they mix them with rat poison they mix them with all of these things and people expect that first responders are going to have Narcan and pull you out of a drug crisis if you're in one and it has worked many times but there comes a time when the drugs are greater than what the drug that they use to save you is. And as a result of that, there will come a time, I'm afraid, that the Narcan won't work because the drugs themselves will be so complicated that it won't have the effect that it normally has. Plus the fact that so many people are using drugs and so many people go into crisis that there may not be the manpower to be able to save everybody. So it's very possible that a person will get into a drug crisis and either there won't be anybody there to pull them out of it like they expect, or if there is somebody there that the Narcan won't work, or the first responders will not be able to function very well because of the fact that if they get any of the drug, if they know what you've taken, on their skin, or if they breathe it in, it'll absorb into their system and they too will become sick and unable to help. So it's a very sad situation, but it's a situation that's healable if everybody gets on track and they're not gonna use the drugs that are dangerous, they're just not gonna use recreational drugs, they're not gonna use drugs that they don't know what's in them. You know, I'm really opposed to drug use because of the fact that it kills people, and sometimes it doesn't kill people, but it makes them mentally incompetent. I heard of this gal or this guy using LSD, and now he won't let anyone touch him. He didn't die with the LSD use, but he feels that his skin is like a tomato. I know this sounds odd, but this is the truth. This is what's happening to him. And he's, he will be confined to a mental hospital for the rest of his life. And he'll be terrified anyone goes to check him or to touch him because he thinks that anybody's hands will go through his entire body because his body is soft like a tomato. And uh, there are others that will try jumping from trees thinking they can fly and they will hurt themselves or kill themselves jumping out of buildings or jumping out of trees. And these are facts of life. This is what we're faced with. So the whole situation of suicide, which is what we're really dealing with, is complicated by the drug crisis because the two intertwine. Now you can ask the question if a person takes drugs and uh, they die from it, is that considered to be a suicide? Or is it considered to be an accidental suicide? Or is it death just by drug overdose and may not have anything to do with suicide? I'm assuming people who take all kinds of drugs will know that at some point they may not make it, and it would be the same as a suicide. So it gets complicated, and it gets complicated because of the drug crisis. Now I came, I'm gonna read you something that I came upon. 
uh, on the internet and it's written by a person who was obviously drug addicted and how the drug has changed him so he is not the same anymore. And uh, I don't know what the title of it is. Uh, the author is Laura Lee Rosano. I did get that, so I do want to give credit for this because it is an amazing piece and I have shortened it. But it's supposedly, I don't know if it's based on an actual fact, case fact, but, but what it describes is real enough and talks about what it's like to be drug addicted. So this is what it says. I am your child or spouse or friend, but I've changed. I don't belong to you anymore. I don't care about you. I care about getting high. I want to get high. I need to get high, and I will step over you to do it. When I look at you, I don't see you. I see a means to an end. You have money, I want it. I don't care if you can't pay the rent. I don't care if you're broke. Sell your rings, take a loan. If you don't, I will steal it. I will find a way to get high. You think you can change me? You're wrong. Something cold is slithering in me. Your tears won't change anything. I have no integrity or values. My morals are a thing of the past. I will do anything to get my fix. If we keep going like this, one or both of us will die. Your world revolves about one thing. Me, I lay trapped within the confines of this cold, dark serpent addiction, and I am dying. This gives you kind of a sense. It, it is a lot longer than this. I kind of condensed it. But it gives you a sense of what happens with the person who's taking drugs, if they're taking hard drugs, cocaine, heroin, and the new synthetic drugs, the fentanyl, and the advances to people who are working with fentanyl to make it even more dangerous than it is. Now what happens is that when you start taking drugs, you feel good about it. Oh, it gives you a relaxed feeling. You feel a little high, and then it passes off, and you don't think anything more about it. You haven't changed. Nothing Nothing's changed, but you did get a relief from your stress and tension for a little while when you were taking the drug. And then you take a little more. And then you discover it takes more of the drug to give you that same kind of high feeling. And so you take a little more. And pretty soon, depending upon the type of drug and how long you've taken it, you can't stop it because what has happened is the chemistry of your brain has changed. The drug has changed the chemistry of your brain. And now it's not a case of you'd like to have a little, to have a little recreational use of the drug. Now the body is demanding it. And if you don't give it to the body that's demanding it, then you will suffer the consequences of withdrawal symptoms, which can be very severe, very painful, that can almost lead to death itself. Withdrawal is so bad that people will do anything to get the drug so that they won't get sick. And in fact, by that time, you don't even want the drug anymore because you know it's making you sick, but you can't stop taking it because if you stop taking it, you will get sick and you'll get very, very, very sick. And so for that reason, you do anything you can to get the drug. Now your total mind and your body is focused on when you can have it again. How long will it be before you start withdrawal? How long will it be before, if you don't take that next fix, you're going to get very sick? How do you keep it secret so your coworkers don't, work, don't, don't know about it, if you can keep it secret? And so it goes on and on and on, and what happens is you get into a spiral that you can't get out of. Now, I'm just kind of condensing this for you. How, what the drug is uh, that you're taking will determine how long it is before you get hooked on it. And some people can take drugs longer than others. And you can get hooked on it so gradually you don't even know it until one day you wake up and you've got to have it. So what's the difference between using drugs recreationally and becoming addicted to it? My own definition, and this is mine, and I don't know if anyone else would agree with me, but I think it bears merit, is the fact when you get to the point where you no longer want it, 
but you need it and you have to have it. That's the point at which now you are addicted because you're not thinking about feeling better and getting high. You're thinking of avoiding getting sick from withdrawal and the withdrawal it can be very severe. So after we go through this whole segment that I'm doing on suicide, and believe it or not, this is connected, I'm going to be going into drug addiction because the two are connected so well. So there are our great, there's a great upswing in the number of people that are attempting suicide. How much of that is due to the fact that they may be addicted to drugs and they see no way out? And by the way, even if they go into rehab, it usually takes several stents at rehab before they can achieve their goal of being able to kick the drug. Seven or eight times in rehab for however long they stay is not unusual before they finally get a handle on it. And many people, as soon as they get out of rehab, they go right back to the drug because the craving is still there. It's very hard to deny a craving because that's what you think about. If you can think about, you get up and you want to have uh, something to eat, something special. You want orange juice or you want coffee and it's on your mind. This is what you want. And you're thinking about it until you finally get it because it's on your mind and this is what you're craving for the moment. Well, there are drug cravings that are much, much so more severe than that. And all they think about is handling that craving for the drug and avoiding getting sick. And that means all of their relationship changes because now they're not interested in their families. They're not interested in their girlfriends or their boyfriends. They're not interested in their college education. They've got to have that fix so they don't get sick from withdrawal. And so the nature of relationships change and parents feel, rightly so, that they've lost their children. Their children aren't the same anymore. And so they put them in rehab. Now, I'm not saying that people in rehab don't try to get well. I think they do try to get well, at least for the most part. There's always the exception to the rule where they don't care and they can't wait to get out on the street to get more drugs. But as a rule, many of them really do want to get well. But as the time progresses and they find they can't get well, then it just gets worse and worse and worse at a more rapid pace. And something else that I find interesting, but I don't have an explanation for it, and I've never read an explanation for it. Suppose you're on alcohol and, you're al and you are an alcoholic. This is your drug of choice because alcohol is a drug too. You can stop the alcoholism. You can stop drinking. You can be a recovering alcoholic. And you might go 15 or 20 years and not take a drop, then suddenly it gets the best of you and you have one drink. As soon as you have that one drink, after 20 years of abstinence, you're just as addicted as you were when you quit to begin with 20 years ago. You're just as addicted. It hits you just as hard. You're just as much in the power of the alcohol as you were before you stopped drinking for those 20 years. And the thing that amazes me, and as I said, I don't have an explanation for it, but your body deteriorates as fast as if you had been drinking all of those 20 years. So you stop drinking, your health improves, your body stabilizes, and that's fine. You start drinking again and suddenly the body deteriorates so fast, it's as, it's as if you had been drinking all of those years, your body deteriorates that fast, but it does it quickly because you hadn't been drinking for 20 years, so now you've started again, your body deteriorates so fast, it's the same thing as if you had been drinking and deteriorating all along. I haven't read any explanation as to why this happens, but it does happen. So how does it relate to suicide, which is what we are basically discussing. Well, suicidal people, some of them, are on drugs, and they see no way out. Once they are entrapped in it, it's like the spider and the fly. I don't know why I'm thinking of this now, but I may as well go along with it. But have you ever saw a spy that's been caught in a spider's web, and they try to get out, and they struggle, and their little legs are moving, and their little wings are moving, and they just cannot pull themselves out? of that web. 
And uh, so it's impossible for them. So it's a little bit the same thing. Once you get addicted and it gets a hold of you, it's really almost impossible to get out. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that nobody ever does get out on their own because I've known a few cases where it's happened. But it's extremely difficult to do that. And most of the time, it's not successful. You really need professional help because they can guide you, they can help you, you have somebody to lean on. If you go to, to uh, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, good for you, because they are a tremendous help. Who can understand an alcoholic better than another alcoholic? Because they've been through it, you know? And so therefore, it, you get help professionally, and then one of the things I used to do, if I was counseling an alcoholic, I used to require them to go to AA. And I used to require them to get medical treatment because of the damage to the body. There have been some people whose bodies and organs have been put, made porous by alcohol. I don't know how to explain it, but it's like when they drink fluids, and I'm not saying just alcohol, when they eat or drink fluids, there's little like pinpoint holes. It's like a porousness about their organs, and all of the, the food in their organs just kind of drips out in their body. Of course, by that time, they're very close to death. But at any rate, there are a lot of physical changes that happen to the body with drug use and that require medical attention. There are a lot of psychological issues that, that need psychological attention. And then you have the act of the addiction, and the addiction has to be handled before the psychodynamics that caused it. And this is a mistake which some people make. They figure if they go into therapy, they'll understand what caused it, and then they'll be able to stop. Nothing is going to stop the addiction. The knowing what the psychodynamics were that caused you to get drunk to begin with, that's not going to stop the addiction. You have to stop the addiction first and then work on the psychodynamics. That's the only way that it works. So if you are seeing a counselor because you're addicted to a drug, they're likely to work on the addiction first and then work on the causative factors after the addiction has been more or less controlled. Because if you work at the the other way around, you're still addicted. You may have a better understanding of what led to your addiction or what happened that made you want to take drugs to begin with. And I think a lot of it is accidental. But at any rate, whatever it was, there may be some causative factors. But until you handle the addiction, the addiction is going to continue. Even if you understand the psychodynamics, the addiction will continue. So what you have to do first is to handle the addiction and then get into the psychodynamics. That's the way that it works, and that's the way that it works the best. But you have to keep at it. Even if you feel that you failed and you can't do it, so you quit, then you start again, then you quit, then you start again. Kind of like the smoker, they can't get rid of the, of the cigarettes, and so they stop for a while, then they're back on. It. You have to keep at it. Even when you feel it's not working, you have to keep at it. That's the only way you're going to get results. It's a very, very difficult thing that you're dealing with, however you get addicted to begin with. So, you know, hang tight. There's hope. There's help. It can, you can recover from it. I'm not saying you'll be completely over the cravings. I don't know how they handle the cravings, you know, because you may want to still. There are people who tell me they still want to get become addicted. They still want to work with the addiction and take the drugs years after they've stopped. But it's, it's a one day at a time with that kind of a problem and with that kind of brain damage. And you know, if, you're, if, if a person is young and they start taking drugs, their emotional development is going to stop at that point. And they're going to not be able to develop emotionally after that into adulthood like they should because everything is around the drugs now. The body has to deal with the drugs and it deals with the drugs and sometimes nothing else. So uh, I just wanted to kind of give you that uh, input. And then I do have this chart I want to show you before I close up here. People who are, are suicidal, and I've said before, for many of them, they're not mentally disturbed. For many of them, it's a case of being in distress and uh, making a decision to do it. So let me take a look at this chart. If you can remember the word solid, S-O-L-I-D, solid, what does it stand 
plan for. Well, the individuals that are, are suicidal are likely in one of these brackets. They're either sad or depressed, sad, older. There's a big upswing in elderly people killing themselves. Are lonely, and that's one of the reasons elderly people become suicidal. All their friends are gone. Ill, and they don't see any, any uh, relief from being ill, or they're addicted to alcohol, or I might add here, addicted to drugs. Sad, old, lonely, ill, drunk those categories. Those categories are where most people who are suicidal will be in those categories. So I think what I'll do, I've almost run out of time. I don't want to start anything new, but I did want to give you a heads up in terms of the connection between drug addiction and, al and alcohol addiction and suicide behavior. And I've always said before, if you can say yes to suicide, you can say no to suicide. So you can actually help to stop yourself from committing suicide, which would be a very, very bad mistake if you do it. For everybody, not just for yourself, because once you do recover, you can have a wonderful life after the crisis is over, and things will happen that will help you. But if you get into a situation that you let the drugs take over, and in a sense, you don't have much of a choice because of the brain chemistry changes, then it's harder and harder and harder to get some kind of a balance and work your way out of it, which is why you need the professional help to begin with. But people do and can recover. And even though there may be some scarring as a result of it, that doesn't mean you can't have a good life. There are a lot of people that have a good life that do have some earmarks of past drug abuse or, or past alcoholic abuse. And so therefore, I want, to, I want to give you a kind of a picture of hope. So what I'm going to do is close it here, and we're going to begin again in terms of suicide, and I'll, I'll bring in the drugs occasionally, and then when suicidology is over with, I'll be doing some classes on drug addiction. And the two will kind of combine together. And I have the uh, Veterans Crisis Suicide Hotline, 1-800-273-8255, and the Domestic Violence Hotline for New Hampshire, 1-866-664-3574. There's going to be help available. Please take these numbers down, even if you feel you don't need them, because chances are somebody that you know needs them, even if you don't. So we'll close it here. Please join me next time.